Howdy everyone, and welcome to the second part of my review of the Super Mario Brothers movie. Now, where did I leave off the first part? Oh uh, yeah, the Beastie Boys. There really has been quite a bit of discourse around the music not composed by Brian Tyler. I'll go more into this later when we get to a specific scene, but for now, I can see why some critics don't like this practice, as doing this can seem lazier than coming up with original music, especially when doing this with popular songs usually dates the movie. I will say that the main non-Nintendo hits in this film are all over 30 years old, so there is something about these songs that has stood the test of time. But yeah, as a Mario fan, I would have much preferred to see more remixes of some of my favorite video game themes, even if you could argue that including those dates the film as well. So for now, I think the best advice that I can give here is to take the critical mindset behind this decision and just, well, tune it out, pun intended. It helps if you like this genre of music to begin with, which I do, so that checks out just fine for me. We then get to the brothers' first plumbing job, and it is ruined by... A uh, dog? Yeah, that part felt a bit weird to me. Is this supposed to be a reference to Duck Hunt? Because I get more Secret Life of Pets vibes from it, and that really threw me off there. Although I did like how it came back at the end to salute the brothers after the climax. Up next is the Mario family, and... Uh, did anyone else think that Mario's father was voiced by Danny DeVito? Turns out he was voiced by Charles Martinet, I just couldn't tell because he wasn't laying on that thick Italian accent. I am aware that he has been more than the voice of Mario over the years. I know that he did a voice for Skyrim, but I have tried that game out multiple times and I just don't like it. I simply find it to be a weak Breath of the Wild ripoff and I will not be told otherwise. Am I getting off topic? Yeah, well, this was the stuff that I was thinking about because this scene and the previous just didn't really do that much to keep my interest. They aren't bad by any means, they work just fine, but I feel like they could be cut out of the film and very little would be lost. Then again, these scenes are probably the closest that we get to character moments between the two brothers, so maybe they are essential in that regard. But we can't focus on that too much because we have to get to the Mushroom Kingdom, and... Honestly, there isn't much to talk about once we get there, because just about all of the major scenes that take place in between the Mushroom Kingdom introduction and the wedding climax, which I will not be giving away in this review, were all highlighted in the trailer. Honestly, what kept my attention here was keeping my ear out for all of the Mario remixes, and trust me, they are there. Everything from Super Mario Bros. and Super Mario Kart to Super Mario 3D World and Mario Kart 8 is on display here, and it is just glorious to listen to. But that does bring the one other big thing to listen to during this part of the film that was not shown in the trailers, and that is, of course, Peaches, 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 Peaches. Yes, if anyone raised an eyebrow when they saw that Illumination got Tenacious D to play Bowser in the film, they had good reason to. Honestly, Bowser might just be the most complex character in the whole film, but that really isn't saying much. He does effectively serve as a major threat to all of the kingdoms in the area, especially when he has command of all of his loyal minions. Ugh, no, not those minions. Why do they have a name as generic as minions? But he also has a large part of his personality defined by Princess Peach being his... senpai. That isn't too surprising, considering what happens in Mario Odyssey, but it might be surprising that the movie does not end with a Mario and Peach wedding. In fact, if there is a romance between the two characters, it is very downplayed. For the most part, they simply work together as partners, and very well at that. Granted, as I just hinted at, the two characters don't really get the time to have any character develop at all, because the movie is laser-focused on cramming in as much action as possible, and this contributes to one of the biggest issues that critics have with this film. Simply put, the film runs and jumps at a breakneck pace. And, well, I say that that is an issue that the critics have, but is it really? After all, I'd much rather have a film go at full speed instead of drag. You know, better busy than bored and time flies when you are having fun and all that. As for how that impacts character moments, or the lack of thereof in this case, that can be troublesome for a film based on a pre-existing property that not everybody is going to be familiar with. 
and Mario is absolutely, positively not that. Mario is more recognizable than Mickey Mouse because he is so easy to understand and get behind. Simply put, you'd have to be as dumb as a career politician to not get Mario's deal. And if, for whatever reason, you don't enjoy anything Mario-related and your masochism leads you to checking out this film, then, well, you might enjoy Take On Me? Yeah, that is the pop song that has easily gotten the most scrutiny in this film, especially since it replaced the Donkey Kong track. And while I would have loved to hear that track in the film, there is something about Take On Me that I am shocked that I have not heard anybody mention. You see, Take On Me is not just a random pop song, oh no. Take On Me is a 1980s rock song, and not just any 1980s rock song. After it failed to make an impact on its first release, its re-release would grow and grow in popularity until it finally hit number one in the U.S. on its 10th week of release, which just so happened to be the week of October 18th, 1985, the exact same date as the release of Super Mario Bros. Yes, both Super Mario and Take On Me hit the big time at literally the exact same time. Coincidence? I think not. This makes the song click for me in the same way that it seems to be lost on everyone else. In fact, the part of that scene that threw me off was the visuals. It looked like this scene was trying to be a precursor to the Mario Kart scene, but with our heroes riding on wooden ramps that go up and down, was anyone else reminded more of Trials than Mario Kart? Probably not intentional, but that was what I was thinking during the scene. Anyways, after that scene, we are introduced to Cranky Kong, and he seems to be the most disliked character in the film, at least as far as his vocal performance is concerned. I will admit, it did throw me off at first, as it was not the cranky old voice that I was expecting, but I'm not gonna lie, it did grow on me over time. To be completely honest, this film made me want Cranky Kong to be a part of the upcoming Mario Kart 8 DLC. And yeah, I guess I should address the rest of the voice acting. For the year between the casting announcement and the first trailer, the cast was really the only impression we could get of what the film could possibly bring us. And given the big-time celebrity voice talent that Illumination got on board, there were many fears that a disservice would be done to the Mario franchise with this voice acting. And it's fine. I didn't mind it at all. None of it is going to redefine how these characters sound to the fans of the franchise, but it is completely serviceable, and that is really all that I have to say about it. And, honestly, that goes for the film itself as well. I took a few days off from writing the script, and when I came back to it, I found that there wasn't much else that I wanted to say about the film proper or at least anything that hasn't been said by any upstanding YouTube critic. I mean, I could say that the movie's perfectly fine and should do a great job of satisfying fans of the franchise, but hasn't everyone and their mother already mentioned that? Looking back at the script, I see that half of this review is the self-proclaimed introduction bit, and that honestly makes sense, considering that it is largely just me putting in the context that I feel like the other reviews for this film are sorely missing. So, in that regard, I guess I should tie in my final thoughts to those three points of context, although even there I already addressed two of them. This film made me very happy as a Mario fan, and the amount of content ripped straight from the games does make this a successful video game adaptation. But does it work as a good film from a critical standpoint? Well, to be completely honest, as someone that does like to examine the films that I watch, saying that about the Super Mario Bros. movie just feels really stupid to me. I mean, the film has made buku bucks, so who cares about what critics think, right? Well, I made a video about that that is supposed to be a precursor to this review, but simply put, critics do ask for more out of films that appeal to the masses, as I honestly believe that they should, but this is not a film that was designed to appeal to the masses. This film was made for Mario fans, and it just so happens that there is a massive amount of Mario fans out there. In that regard, critics should be asking just one question. Is this a good Mario movie? Does it look like a Mario, jump like a Mario, and wahoo like a Mario? If so, then it's probably just a Mario movie of quality. And I get that just because a movie is adapted from source material does not mean that the movie has an excuse to be shallow, but if anyone says that about this film in particular, I will just tell them to look at the source material in question. The Mario franchise is as complex as a glass of water. Mario games have become world-famous not because of their stories, but because of their simple yet intuitive gameplay. 
in that regard, it's kind of interesting that we got the exact opposite with The Last of Us franchise earlier this year, and much less surprising that it got a much better critical response. And the Mario movie does not deserve a bad critical response. Honestly, before the film came out, I was expecting it to get roughly the same reception as the director's last film, Teen Titans Go to the Movies, with a low 90 on Rotten Tomatoes and a high 60 on Metacritic. Maybe critics had higher expectations for Mario than Teen Titans? Maybe Teen Titans Go was trying harder to be a crowd-pleaser than a fan-pleaser? In that case, the box office massively underwhelmed there. But here? Well, for the past few decades, Mario has never really needed to try in order to sell, but he did try here and I am all the happier for it. If you are a Mario fan that has not seen this film yet for whatever reason, I would definitely check it out, at least when it comes to streaming. I really don't think you'll regret it. So, with all that said, thank you so much for watching, click the red button to subscribe, and have a fantastic day doing whatever your heart desires. Wahoo!